Hey, I'm Bob. Been totally blind since birth and I'm into He-Man. We're talking about episode two of the Netflix TV series He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. This one's called Power of Skull. Spoilers ahead, so watch the episode before listening to everything I liked concerning said episode. So let's get into this thing. I liked the opening skirmish. I liked seeing a newly transformed He-Man not really knowing what to do with his powers. He just knew he needed to defend his family, his tribe. And there's this one scene where he's attempting to squeeze his eyes shut and he winds up bonking his head on one of the bots, sends it falling right over. That was an interesting scene there. And at the same time, we get to see Evelyn showcasing her magic. She's cast a duplication spell and whenever he-man punches a bot it multiplies and tila she's seen what evelyn can do so i like how she was attempting to coach him uh, to to stop punching things but uh you know he's he's fighting for his life so he's not really strategizing at the moment and i like this big cinematic super move that he pulls off it felt like something you might see in uh, final fantasy 7 or 10 or 10 2. i watched my friend ryan play uh, final fantasy 7 way back in the day and i thought of some of the big uh, cinematic attacks that I think it was Cloud, I think that was his name, the main protagonist would pull off in that game. Uh, and I'm wondering if we're going to see more of these as the show progresses. This feels like, you know, an opening skirmish in a video game. Maybe as the show progresses, we'll see He-Man and some of the other characters gain new skills and new powers and new armor and that kind of stuff. Really cool attack, though, especially with the descriptive audio track turned on. I feel like I'm really getting to see uh, Eternia and its its denizens for the first time with this show and uh, and Revelation. So I'm having a ball with with this stuff on Netflix. So we we get to see you know that big cinematic attack pulled off and looked pretty flashy. It, it had a bit of an anime flavor to it, which I liked. And at the same time, we see. Cronus, and he's hunting Crass and Cringer. There's a bit of a dark moment there. He seemed about ready to gut these two with a knife after he'd thrown them both into a tree, but uh, Duncan shows up in that commandeered ship, and he just bowls uh, Cronus right over. And, uh, you know, Adam has, or He-Man, I should say, has reverted to Adam, and I think Evelyn was about ready to uh, finish these two off before... Duncan bowls her over as well. Of course, she's encased in a force field, so she's fine. But she does hear Tila mention the name Adam. And that sparks recognition in her. And she clearly knows that name and knows who he is. So I like this bit of downtime we get after seeing the main protagonists get on to the ship and escape the villains. Well, of course, first we, we see Crass, and she's not too keen on letting Tila aboard, but uh, she does, I guess, slightly warm to that idea. She's not too keen on it, though. She's very protective of Adam. At the same time, I feel like she's a bit uh, jealous, and she doesn't she doesn't want things to uh, to happen between uh, Adam and Tila. So, uh, but but she does. Uh, Put that in this place so we get this bit of downtime where the main protagonists are trying to figure out the ins and outs of the sword they're trying to chant the incantation they want to emulate what adam has done in order to transform but they just can't figure it out and i like uh, i like that scene though he wakes up and he's okay and everyone comes to the conclusion that the sword's out of juice and they need to figure out how to uh, how to recharge it and tila of course mentions gray skull and uh, and her connection to it and later on after the characters have uh, found a place to hunker down and hide from the villains we get this nice scene with uh, adam and crass and he he doesn't really want things to change and neither does she but uh, she really wants to help him see this thing through no matter what happens uh, he of course doesn't remember his former life before he was adopted by the by the tiger tribe and by cringer and uh, these guys have been pals since they were kids 
and uh, she's not ready to let that go and he's a bit scared too but uh, she uh, she does uh, show that she is a friend and that she does support him by you know telling him that she's going to be there to help him see it through no matter what is revealed to them all so yeah that was a really sweet scene and you know we get to hear just a bit more of Tila and how she feels as if she's had a connection to Grayskull for a long time as well. So uh, speaking of the uh, the main protagonist, we get to see a bit more of Randor here, and this is only the second time I've watched this this uh, first season, so I don't know if we get to see uh, his wife. I, I don't even remember if Queen Marlena is in this or not, but in this episode, he is by himself. And I mean, Randor is under the impression that his son has been killed, that his brother has been killed. And uh, he seems like he's a bit of a harder man than we've seen in other incarnations. I mean, he is a man who has lost it all. I mean, even though he is ruler of this kingdom, uh, he's had, you know, no one to, uh, to soften his heart. So it was interesting seeing him in these two episodes. I think we see a bit more of him later on. Forgive me if, uh, if I made the mistake of thinking Marlena is not in this. She very well could be. This is only my second uh, watch through. So uh, bear with me here. Uh, I think the main show stealer in this episode was was Keldor. I loved seeing uh, Cronus and Evelyn happen upon those uh, those soldiers who uh, Keldor was draining the life force from and we know that he has been afflicted with this blight of havoc and the only way for him to keep his flesh from turning to bone is to kill people pretty much so he has been reduced to this vampiric state if i can use that word <laughs> and uh i like the way he feels a bit similar to keldor from the 2000x show the mike young show in that respect he is uh clinging to life and uh he is not well uh, but at the same time, he'll do whatever he needs to do to survive. And he's not Skeletor yet, but uh, I like those hints of the character coming through with the hand turning from bone to flesh and uh, from flesh to bone later on as well. So we get to see the bad guys kind of having a bit of downtime as well. And we are getting to see the villains finally come together. We get to see more pieces of that puzzle falling into place. We learn that Cronus and Evelyn, they were working with Keldor, and 10 years ago on a fateful night, this coup had taken place, and Keldor wanted the sword for himself, but he chose this uh, Havoc staff. The descriptive audio track calls it a scepter, but I'm always going to think of it as a Havoc staff, and that's why Keldor is afflicted with this blight of Havoc. And he feels as if, if he can get that sword, that's what's going to cure him. So, you know, like in every other incarnation, he wants the power of Grayskull. But, uh, but this time, it's a life and death situation. He, he feels like he needs it in order to, to stay human, to stay alive. So, um, you know, he's, he's already putting a plan into motion. And this is when Evelyn mentions... Adam, or she uh, she doesn't actually mention his name, but I'm sure she does after the scene switches because uh, she does mention to him that, you know, he might not be the only royalty that's that survived the coup. And uh, it's a really, it's a really interesting scene there. I love seeing the bad guys just kind of gathering together. We haven't seen her cause yet, but uh, we, we see the, um, what do you call these guys? The evil masters of the universe, the... Uh, the main antagonist that they're they're forming and Skeletor, sorry, Keldor's getting the band back together. So I, I love the stuff with him in this episode. He's just uh, always been one of my favorite characters, no matter what the incarnation is. And of course, you know, the episode ends with uh, the bots finding our main protagonists. And um, 
there's a bit of a battle, but they, they can't get the sword to work. They need to find Grayskull as well to get the thing recharged and uh, to find out what the heck happened to Adam 10 years ago. But here comes Keldor. And I mean, he is a master manipulator. Of course, these main antagonists are using the poacher bots to further their own ends because Keldor comes in like a hero and he deactivates them all. He just annihilates them with his Havoc staff. And we see him playing the part of a compassionate uncle because he does reveal to Adam that he is his dear old uncle Keldor and he tells Adam that it's time to come home and you know Adam is just ripe for manipulation I don't really remember too much of what happens after this episode I can't wait to get into uh, the next couple of episodes I, I do kind of remember how uh Keldor gets his his new look, his new outlook on life, so to speak. I can't wait to get to that. Uh, this is just such a, a fun show when you're watching it episode by episode, not binge watching it. I do enjoy that too, but it's fun to go back and just watch it day by day, episode after episode, and really digest what's going on, getting to see the characters develop, getting to see the world built, the story built up, all the plot threads and things like that put into place. So I'm really having a ball with this show. And next time we're going to be talking about the heirs of Grayskull, I think. That's what the third episode's called. So uh, please be here for that. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and all that good YouTube stuff if you want. Okay. Hear you later. Uh, you have the power and all that. And uh, I'll hear you next time. I already said that. <laughs> have a great day. No matter what I said twice.